the morning after the election day. I don't know if you stayed up late to watch. I know there's a number of things or a number of states, I should say, that have not reported. It's still contested. Um, we do not have a new clearly defined president as of yet. Uh, my prayer is that uh, Trump is reelected. That is my personal p position. And I do believe that we, we were voting for ideologies this this time around, not not candidates. Uh, we were because the ideologies of both parties are very, very antithetical. But this morning I was uh, perusing my my uh, books on theology and I happened to come upon this one book and I had forgotten I even had it. I don't refer to it. It is uh, Evangelical Theology and Introduction. It was written by Karl Barth. Now that's B-A-R-T-H. It was written in 1963 by Karl Barth. And um, I bring this up not because I like this book. This book actually is not a good book. Bart was a moderate, what was was one of our early um, liberals in the mindset of the of Christian theology. His theology has tainted, and his positions have tainted many in their beliefs in the theology of the Bible. He he held to the German rationalism of the 1800s, and um, I have this book not because it was given to me to refer to. It was given to me to warn me. And so that I have a little understanding on where he's coming from. In fact, my father-in-law actually gave me this, uh, not because he wanted to corrupt my, my mind, but because of just that reason to warn me. And you know, in life, we're given warnings. In my library here that I have, I do have books that I would vehemently disagree with. I have some very liberal books on various topics in biblical study. And the reason for that is not because I want to I want to read liberal things and believe it, but because I need to be able to make a defense against it. And also too, some of the very liberals, especially in Old Testament studies, this is where it really rings true. There were many Germans who worked in the Old Testament studies in the late 1800s, early 1900s that were very, very off in their biblical understanding. And but but they have been the quote the the leaders in that study. And the problem is it caused a lot of higher critical thinking. Now let me explain. I, I might use some terms today that we're not all used to hearing. What is higher critical thinking? Well higher critical thinking against the Bible is taking the Bible apart and saying, well, this was not written by God. This was not written by the people that, that were mentioned. This, is, uh, this was added at later times. Um, one big thought process of the higher critical thinking against the Bible is what is called the Wellenhausen theory. Now you might say, what is that? Well, it's also known as the JEDP theory. Now let me explain. The first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, uh, many w w were taught, and I was taught, and I think it's true, and it's I believe it's supported, that Moses wrote those books. It's called the Pentateuch. Penta meaning five. It's the first five books of the Bible. Well, the critics have said, no, because of different language being used and the different names of God being used, that Moses could not have wrote, written it. And the doctrines, especially in Leviticus, he could not have thought all of these doctrines. And they take away the whole miraculous part of the Holy Spirit's working. And they end up saying, no, it was pieced out. And Deuteronomy was actually written at the end of the Old Testament time period and on and on and on. Basically, it's a critical attack against the Bible. And it comes out that the Bible is not God's word. Well, Bart holds to a lot of this and others hold to, to this. And it's a very common thought process today in the seminary. It's very sad. But I say all this. Is because we are in a world that's changing and it's changing away from God. And it wasn't based on the past four years, I'm stating this. It's been based on many, many years. There were early attacks against our Christian faith uh, throughout the history of the church. In the late 1800s, we had the higher critical thinking of the Germans entering into theology. 
the beginning of our uh, of our um, uh, of the 1900s, we had the problem with the World Council of Churches and the National Council of Churches. These wicked groups that compromised and that took away the um, ideas of inerrancy of the Bible and brought in side issues to, to and traditions that were very, very anti-biblical for their belief systems. And many denominations fell into what was called social gospel. What is the social gospel? Just doing things, nice things for others is sufficient. That's your salvation. That's not what the Bible says. We should do nice things for others. We should be socially active as the church to help the needs of others. But the, but the reasoning is not just the helping but can we share the gospel, the true gospel with them? Well, we're seeing this happening everywhere. And sad to say, even in the church, we are seeing people, that leaders that are coming up, that are substituting. So I want, I want us to just focus on two verses this morning out of the book of Romans. Now, what is Romans? Romans was a book written by Paul. It's probably the best doctrinal book in the whole Bible, if not, at least in the, in the New Testament. And these two verses, verses 16 and 17 of chapter 1, Paul nails it. And you might say, oh, I've heard those verses before whenever I read them. You might say, well, I understand that. But you know what? This is going to become more vital all the time. On my phone, I, um, I've been involved with a group um, that that is uh, sharing uh, and training individuals in Pakistan. And um, Pakistan is under great persecution in the church. I remember not too long ago, even Franklin Graham got up and said, uh, church, be, be prepared. We might be seeing attacks even today. We're not seeing people being thrown into jail or being persecuted or tortured. But we are seeing churches, uh, the government's trying to shut churches down in certain states for things that do not hold water. And then others in other states, other church leaders have even condemned those who are pastors and leaders in the churches that are being persecuted. And it's we're, we're in a very, very mixed up time. But I'll just read to you a few things here. Uh, this is from no, uh, oh, on November 7th, there will be pastors joining and there will be a number of baptisms. In fact, since the beginning of the year, February of 2020, 423 people have been baptized. And this is believers baptism, meaning they accepted Christ as, as, their, as their savior and they are now baptized. And this is a country where they can be put to death. This is not uncommon. It's not everywhere, but persecution of the church is everywhere. The United States has been one of the countries, one of the few countries, if not one of the only countries in this world today, where being a Christian, you're not persecuted for it, or you're not set aside as some kook person or some nutcase. And we have we have the freedom to to spread the gospel openly now there are some areas where that's being taken away that's being challenged that's being church the church has been attacked and sad to say we have individuals that have not just attacked it verbally or even through the court system but also too have taken it upon themselves with with weapons to kill christians in this country which is very sad uh don't be don't be shocked no matter who wins this election, that we continue to see riots. We continue to see looting. Last night in some of the cities, at least one city, there was looting and rioting. What kind of a response is that when you don't even know who won? And they did it. Uh, they, they, and the, the, the bottom line is not so much I'm defending a cause. No, the bottom line is I'm taking something that I didn't earn. And... The wickedness of man is coming to fruition big time, in our, in not just in our nation, but around the world. It's happening everywhere. One of the sick things that I was told recently is that 
men in this country of Pakistan that are Islamic in nature. They have been allowed by the governments to go in and take young girls of ages 13 and older from Christian homes and marry them so that they can reconvert them back to Islam from Christianity. People are being told not just here, but I have another magazine here that I that I was perusing yesterday. Um, this is called The Voice of the Martyrs, and it's talking about Sri Lanka. That was the that was the focal point. Um, bombings and other attacks and evangelism in Afghanistan and in North Korea. North Korea is considered to be the worst country in the world. They will kill you if you are found out, if you're North Korean and you have you have committed your life to Christ and you have accepted him as Savior. They will take your life. This is the world that we live in. You go to Europe. Europe, they have pretty much made the, the church irrelevant. Um, I, the last church I worked at uh, as an assistant or as a as an interim music director, it was First Baptist Church Claremont in Claremont, Florida by Orlando. Um, I know their youth group, their youth leader took took a group of young people to um, to Wales when I was there. And they were shocked at the lack of Christian influence in Wales. We're talking about a, an industrialized nation that you think, oh, that's, that must be a nice place. In Canada, the seminaries and churches are being uh, are under attack for preaching and teaching the word of God when it comes to certain social things such as homosexuality in that. And you, you think of Canada as, oh, this is a great nation. And I think it, I, I, I think you know, over the years it's been a great nation. I really do. I think it's a very beautiful nation. I've been to Canada. But the freedoms that we have in this country that are slipping away more and more. And, you know, this, this election might even change it even worse it might keep it the same. We don't know, but we do know God is in control. But I look at this, not with depression this morning, but with a sense of purpose that, what are we, what are we really focusing on? You know, just yesterday, I was, um, I was talking to a company about, um, about some equipment for our, for our, our technical equipment. And um, in their in their magazine, I think I, I threw the magazine out and I, I printed out this this big set of papers that um, the FCC and they said, oh, we made a public. Well, no, it wasn't made public that I have to now assess all of our microphones that are wireless because they have they have taken certain bands that my, that wireless microphones were on and they sold those bandwidths to the television companies and it's now illegal to use them and you can be fined upwards of ten thousand dollars this is the world we're living in today it's a little bit is chipped off here a little bit is chipped off there it's like a chip here a chip here a chip here finally after a while there's not much to chip off you know you might say well that affects everybody it does it it just not affects the houses of worship they say but also venues that do like entertainment in that but what we're seeing is we're seeing the taking away of the rights that I do think have been a great setting in our nation to spread the gospel. Have we always done it? I don't think so. Have we sometimes sat down and relaxed a bit more than we should? Probably. But as Christians, we might have to, we might, because of what's happening in our political realm and society, we might have to make some choices. You know, I, I've been seeing recently, and I think shortly I'm going to be speaking on this at the church, is what is the end time, what is the end time timeline? I see a lot of people speaking on it, and they're all mixed up. They're not even taking biblical positions. I can give you, I'll give you two things and then let's look at the Romans passage. One thing is the Bible, I, I truly believe in what is called a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. We are not going to be exposed to the 666 
the 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 sign of the uh, of the Antichrist, because there's there's things about that. If you take that 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 you are not a child of the King, I do not believe that the Bible teaches that we can lose our salvation, and because of that, we're not going to see this. And and there's a lot more to it. And I I, I if when I have the time to to explain it, I might even do this on a broadcast setting. But I've heard so many mixed up things and the worry about, oh, you're going to be given a microchip and all this other stuff. You know what? That might be the way that uh, that the mark of the beast is given through microchip. I know over the course of the time it's been on the forehead and I'm talking about on the on the wrist and that of the hand. You know, it could be a microchip. It could also be a barcode. We don't, it's, it's hard. We don't know. These are all guesses, you know, and, and, and some are good guesses and some are pretty bad guesses. But I do not believe that that the church is going to be put under that temptation and that and that thing, because I can tell, tell you right now, there will be Christians. If we are here, and I don't believe we're going to be, there will be Christians who will take that mark just to get by thinking I can ask for forgiveness. It's pretty clear that it says you can take the mark of the beast. You are not a child of the king. So I would, I'm, I'm, I really do lean, and, and I've studied for many years in this um, under many great professors and teachers on this topic, and I truly believe we're not going to see that. Uh, a, a second thing is, is that before the Lord returns, we are going to see of falling away from God. Now, I've worked at an, at an institution called the Holy Land Experience. I've mentioned this many times. All, all my church members know this. Um, there was a big push with many of the, of the, quote, the Christian leaders that work with TBN, and these would include people like Joseph Prince and, and uh, Benny Hinn and Mark Sharona, and there are a number of other ones, Todd White, Paula White, they all were preaching and teaching, oh, the world is getting better and better and we're going to win the world for the Lord. Well, we need, to, we need to pursue sharing our faith for that end. But the Bible in reality is saying that people are falling away from God. And we're seeing it even, even in the church. And there's a lot of confusion out there. Doctrinal clarity is very big with me. I know I've taken more than one test on spiritual gifts. And my spiritual gift every time, the very first one is teaching. And then after that, sometimes it jostles back and forth between pastoral and serving. And every once in a while, I, and I think it's because of, the, of some of the things I read or see, um, every once in a while will pop up the gift of prophecy. And the standpoint of that is not so much I'm telling you new information, but the other job of the prophet was to look at, look at things and see right or wrong, and sometimes I can I can really see that well, but I know every born again Christian, once you once you accept Christ as Savior, on the, at that moment you're given a spiritual gift. Now to develop that it takes time, and through church work and and through attending services and through training you can help develop that. And, and God can help to develop it in you. But I know for sure my main gift is preaching. And I think many times uh, pastoral or shepherding comes up and then service. So those would be probably my three main gifts. And um, uh, But always primary, always comes up as teaching. And because of that, it's been something that has been very important with me. Proper doctrine is very important to me. But I want to read you these two verses because I want you to understand these are common verses that all of us probably watching will say, I've seen that before. I've read that. I know that. But these are going to become, I believe if the Lord tarries and as this world's going, these are going to become super important to make a decision on, do I hold to them? Here it is, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, 
as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Those two verses are very important. They summarize how we should behave as a Christian, what we should do as a Christian. And right now, in the life that we have in this country, these are very easy verses to accomplish. They, they really are. I know when we go out to eat, and lately we've been what I call escaping to P Pensacola a little bit just to take a break. And we'll eat out at a restaurant. And we've been doing that. I mean, since they've lightened up with the pandemic and since we've caught the virus, we have went through it. I'm not as worried about myself and Carolee isn't either. We, we have immunities. We're not, we're, we don't do ignorant things. I mean, we'll, as the, whatever the, the stores say, we go with our masks and we'll wear a mask and that. And that's a whole nother issue in itself. Do they all work? Well, I think they do two major things the masks that I see people having outside of the ones that the doctors have that N9 or whatever that special mask is, it keeps you from touching your face, which is one good thing. And it also keeps, I guess, your water droplets from exiting unless you have a mask that you wear all the time. That's, that's a cloth mask that isn't even doing that. But for the most part, it's not allow, keeping you from breathing in any of the bacteria or that or the, or the virus. It does protect some, I guess, but um, I think washing of hands, that's the one thing that I was told by every doctor, every medical professional, wash your hands, and we still do that, and I still practice that, and I also carry, you know, the little things I got, it fell off my desk, I got this, this Germex, and they say, uh, this is 62% alcohol in it, ethanol alcohol, I think you have to have over 60 or something like that, or something like that, but I, I, you use this, it helps kill the germs, but washing with soap and water takes away the germs. All of those things, that's important. And I do practice that, and we and Carolee does too, and we, we're not out trying to say, oh, we don't care. No, that's not the, no, that's not how we look at it. And, and here, even at the church, I will wear a mask in many instances, especially on service days, because I do not want to be a cause of somebody being afraid. That's not why I'm the pastor of J First Baptist Church. But getting to this, this is a co the core of our faith right now. And it should always have been, and it should always be, that I am going to spread the gospel. I'm not ashamed of it. And the gospel of Christ, not the social gospel, not the gospel of being fair to everybody, because that's what's being taught some by, by some. Oh, the gospel is being fair. No, the gospel is not being fair. The gospel doesn't address fairness. Even in the time of the Roman Empire, there was not fairness. What was Christ coming for? In the, in the time that he was here, when he walked the earth for those three and a half years in that, we see him in his ministry time. Life was not fair. There was slavery. There were others. There were those that were subjected um, to... to uh, into very terrible things by the Roman Empire. He did not come to overthrow the Roman Empire. He came to bring salvation and freedom from sin. And that's how Christianity has always been worked and always worked in this world. And we have to understand that. That yes, I, I think fairness is great. I think we need to be honest. I think the world needs to be fair. But I'll tell you this, it's not. And we're growing farther, farther away from an ethic of being fair. And those that have are the ones who are going to control. And that's how it is. Um, at least in the mindset of man. Now, does God write things? He does. Does God still give us peace in times of trouble? He does. And I can attest with a daughter that struggles with autism that we did not as a couple and throughout our lives we were not the ones doing drugs. We were not the ones doing alcohol. We were not the ones misbehaving and doing naughtiness. When we got married, we were both pure. We went into marriage how it should have been. We, I was serving the Lord, going to seminary, finished seminary, serving the Lord. Carolee was serving as a nurse, behaving as a good Christian woman. All of these things, we have a child and... The child is handicapped. 
And some people say, well, that's not fair. Well, I was told this by a gentleman named Bill Guinea. And I will tell you, I, lo I love Bill Guinea. And if he ever sees this, may, may this be a blessing to him. Bill Guinea was a great guy. He's a great guy. I believe he's still alive. He worked with me at the Holy Land Experience. And he was a super guy. And he was very practical. He came from Ohio down to Florida. He was a, I think he was a, um, a cattle man. Uh, I think he raised uh, dairy cattle, if I'm not mistaken. And he was one of the shakers and movers at the Holy Land Experience. And he was like third in charge. He set up a lot of a lot of the speaking engagements for the founder, Marvin Rosenthal. And Bill Guinea called me aside one day because he knew, the whole facility knew, we, we had struggles. Uh, when we came back from Honduras to the States and I started working at the Holy Land Experience, Marv was a good friend of my father and mother-in-law. And they talked to him about what we were going through. We didn't know at that time our daughter was autistic. When we got back, Carolee's mother paid for a specialist, and within 20 minutes, he diagnosed her. You have an autistic daughter. She's little. As she gets older, you're going to find out even more how autistic she is. Well, <clears throat> Bill Guinea pulled me aside one day, and he knew we were having some real struggles with Alexis. Uh, she, she, in her earliest years especially, really had issues with, with uh, anger and uh, really some great problems there. And he said, you know, George, he said, and he was a father of two sons that had great issues, mental issues. <clears throat> but he and his lovely wife, who also worked at the Holy Land Experience, they, they, they worked with it. When they became adults, uh, I guess they grew out of some of it. But he said this, he said, George, he said, God must have thought pretty highly of you to give you a daughter like Alexis. Because he says a lot of people wouldn't be able to handle it. Because, you know, in this world we think it's not really fair. Why, why did this happen? Well, because God has his ways and we don't always know his economy. But Bill Guinea said, you don't worry. You have people who pray for you regularly and God's still in control. And, you know, I remember hearing that when I wasn't on a mountaintop. And it made a difference. In this world we're living today, it's not always easy to share our faith and to, to show that we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And fellow Christian, I don't know, I don't know where you worship. Whoever watches this, I know usually there's more than probably the actual watchers, they watch it later. But we need to be reminded that Paul lived in a day where it wasn't fair. There wasn't this social justice push that really is not about social justice. It's about gaining a power. There wasn't a fairness in society. There wasn't a, a catch net of safety net for those that have great needs. It was a time when people died because they didn't have. And society was not nice many times, even in the Jewish society. <clears throat> but I will tell you this. If as we go through and very possibly harder and harder times that we need to be reminded that God is still in control, he loves us dearly, and we need never to be ashamed of the gospel because we do not know who is there and who is around us who needs to hear that gospel. And I will tell you, Sunday, Sunday was a Sunday was a mixed bag this past Sunday. The gremlins were in this were in the sound equipment. We did get through, but something miraculous happened. A little boy of seven years old named Weston accepted Christ as Savior. That's what it's about. The gremlins can have their heyday, but the salvation is the important part. So we did have a good Sunday. Let me close by saying a <clears throat> um, couple things happening. This Sunday, we're going to be having a business meeting. So people, if you're able to come to, to the campus, please. If you um, are, are able only to watch, that's wonderful. Watch, at least watch. 
on the on the on the Facebook. We are going to continue Facebook. I'm working on learning how to do it, transfer things to YouTube if they haven't been done yet. Um, there's some things I'm going to have to adjust with, and I'm going to have to take uh, take on my shoulders a little bit that I haven't been doing. Uh, we're also doing communion this Sunday. So let me encourage you with the communion part of the service. Um, if you would like to partake of communion at home watching, we that's not a problem. I have self-contained communion cups. What I need you to do is give me a text, call by, call the office, come by, and pick up your communion cups. And we'd look. I don't mind you doing that, but we are going to have them here. We're using the self-contained cups to keep things more more sanitary, and we will be doing that at the end of the service. So, um, just please be re reminded of that. Um, I want all of our membership to be able to partake. And and we you know we we do we do hold to an open communion and maybe there's even somebody watching this today that lives in our community that maybe you haven't been attending either you haven't been maybe for various reasons you've chosen not to go back to your church or you're just not involved in church you're born again Christian and you know Christ as Savior uh, we do open con communion here if you're not a born again Christian. If you are not right with the Lord, I give a warning. Don't even attempt to do a communion because in 1 Corinthians, Paul was pretty pretty straightforward to the church of Corinth who was abusing communion. He said, you can, you can have great wrath from God for this. So he, so I don't recommend. I, communion is not a, is something you just take lightly. It's one of the two ordinances of the church. And it's a very special one because it reminds us of what Christ did on the cross for us in his resurrection. So that's very important, but we're doing that this Sunday. And we are, I have to also tell you this, this is exciting. The guys are outside putting gutters on, on our church building. So we're starting that. So I'm very, very pleased with that. So we are, we are going to the right direction and we need to continue that the votes are counted are right. And whatever, candidate wins the votes that are counted are done are done in a right manner not in a dishonest manner and that can happen and there are a lot of people and i would dare say probably could be on even even both sides of the aisle that can misbehave to get their way that's not how it should be our country has survived for over 200 years doing it or supposedly doing it in a right manner we need to continue that it's a good system and the electoral college is a good system and basically those when they lose they say oh it's a bad system no it's a good system it protects all of the country all of the states in our country but for for i am not ashamed of the gospel of christ for it is the power of god to salvation to everyone that believes to the jew first also to the greek let's bow for prayer dear heavenly father we come before you once again we do thank you for all that you do for us. And Lord, this our nation today is in your hands. Whatever is decided, it's your will. And Lord, all I can ask is please have mercy. Please have grace. Allow us to continue to, to be open in our society to be able to spread the gospel. And may you give us the strength and power and wisdom to never be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I thank you for those that serve with me here at this church in J First Baptist, others in our community that serve you. <clears throat> I lift them up. I ask for your grace, your mercy, your power with them, your understanding, your wisdom. And may, and may not just this area, but our surrounding areas and around the world be affected to, to work through the work in Jesus Christ of those in this community. And we thank you for the opportunities you've given us and the open doors. May you please keep them open. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Folks, God bless and shalom.